Welcome everyone to the Campus Pride Spotlight Series. My name is Ayla Zim, my pronouns are she and her, and I'm an intern with Campus Pride. For those who don't know, Campus Pride is a leading national nonprofit organization that empowers student leaders and campus groups working to create equitable college environments for LGBTQ plus students. You can learn more at campuspride.org. Today I'll be interviewing Washington State University for the Campus Pride Spotlight Series. This series is all about what campuses offer today's LGBTQ plus students, our diverse genders and sexuality spectrum. We will highlight colleges and universities that are providing LGBTQ plus inclusivity on their campuses and learn more about their programs and services. I want to introduce to you the representatives from Washington State University now. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Marco Cerqueira. I am a graduate assistant in GSR, and I use the pronouns he, him, el, el. I'm Matthew Jeffries. I use he, him, his pronouns, and I am the director of the Gender Identity Expression and Sexual Orientation Resource Center. Thank you both so much for introductions. It's wonderful to have you all here today. You have a five out of five star rating on the Campus Pride Index at campusprideindex.org, and you've been ranked among the best of the best in terms of LGBTQ plus friendly colleges and universities. So congratulations. Um, to start out, tell us what are some things that are on your campus for LGBTQ plus life, and specifically, what does your campus do for LGBTQ plus students that creates an inclusive space? Ooh, that's a heavy order, uh, but I love it. So. I think some of the biggest things that we have been thinking about most recently, right? Because we've been a center since the mid nineties. And so I think I first wanna say that we're forever indebted to some of the folks who are directors and leaders within our communities uh, of yesteryear, right? And I think right now we're looking at what do our students need? What do they want? Um, we're lucky that we live in Washington, which is really quite progressive uh, in, in the nation. And so we are focused really on healthcare how can our students, we're located in a pretty remote part of the state of Washington, about six miles from uh, the Idaho border. And so we've been talking a lot about what does healthcare look like here? So if we don't offer great healthcare in our medical clinic and in our counseling centers, we, our students may not be able to have access to it other places. And so we've been really partnering closely with our health services office. Um, we're also really pushing forward on um, putting pronouns on class rosters, which has been uh, a call from our students most recently. And so that's coming, I think, in the fall because we already have chosen names on a lot of stuff. So um, our identification cards allow for chosen name, um, class rosters, all that kind of stuff. And there's always, you know, flukes in technology, but we have some great partnerships across the institution to work through those uh, issues. Um, so those are some of the big things, I think, policy-wise. I think the other thing is, is how do we create community? So we know a lot of our students get to WSU and get to Pullman, right, coming from oftentimes Seattle and these other large metropolitan areas. And they're like, where did I move? And so we have created uh, something called the Q-Hort. It's a, a first-year program during Week of Welcome that just builds on what students are learning in their new student orientation but puts it into a real queer focused lens. So we do, you know, maybe a little bit of vocab for folks that are, they didn't get some of that growing up or, you know, didn't need that uh, where they were living. Um, but it also gives folks uh, the information on policies and where to go for a doctor and, you know, all that kind of stuff, that nitty gritty details that you may not pick up in a regular orientation. And then it's also about building community. Like, who are my queer friends here? Like, who am I gonna know if I'm the only one from my, <coughs> Uh, high school or you know my community college if they're a transfer student potentially or at another university so those are the big things that we focus on when students get here uh, and then throughout the year we just start build community in our center um you know through lunches and you know informal communications and just hanging out um uno is a cultural component of our center i feel like and so uno is always going on in the afternoons uh when our students are hanging out in our space so those are some of the things, Marco. I will kick it over to you to, to add anything else. Um, you know, you were the first person that I contacted when I was transferring from University of Florida to Washington State. And as a person of color, queer, and international student, I had I, 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 I needed to make sure that I was going to a, a, an, an environment, an university that will be, I will be accepted, fully accepted. And I can say, as a, now I'm in my last year in my PhD, I not only was accepted, I must end up working two years for Matthew Jeffries for G-Sorry. And um, 
you know, promoting events, being events, and having all the beautiful community that we have here. So. That is wonderful, both wonderful answers. Um, so thank you both so much for your answers. Um, what example can you share that signifies the importance of having a space on campus for an LGBTQ plus student? Do you want to start, Mark, or do you have me? You start. Okay. okay. <laughs> that one example. I think, so for me, oh, I just, let me try to pull one perfect example or a great example. I think we, so I will say that on our um, orientation tours, everyone gets to, everyone has to walk into our space. They have to come in as part of uh, the orientation program and see it and experience the space, right? So that no one can say that they've never been or never seen our, our office. And I think, you know, we see in the first week, a lot of our students who, um, in particular one that I have in mind, who necessarily couldn't come out when they were back home. They were in a more rural and conservative family um, that wasn't very affirming or welcoming. And so they came in, they'd be very quiet, um, just doing their work on their computer in our center. And then eventually, you know, they got more and more comfortable in the space and then they could actually connect with others, right? And so I think it was just, it's a landing spot for folks. Um, we're in our student union, um, which is pretty busy, especially at lunchtime. And so students grab their lunch and bring it up and they create that easy community together, right? It's just, I don't wanna say it's effortless, but it's delightful to watch folks just engaging with each other. Like, oh, tell me about that. Oh, where'd you get that outfit? Or where'd you get this or that? And so um, we see how that works uh, just in this really organic way. I have a good example. Um, I remember before the pandemic, uh, we had a meeting, a gathering for the GPOLs, is the graduated professional students uh, who identifies LGBTQ plus have an uh, association. And um, I had a friend of mine who was he was doing a postdoc here, he's from India, and um, he's not out in his country. And um, it was just so beautiful to see him. You know, Matthew was actually in the meeting too, and uh, I, I think you remember him. And um, it was just so nice to see him you know, relax and have a good laugh, you know, have a drink and, you know, having, it's just the, the importance, right, of, to build community and uh, for this acceptance, just so important for, you know, for us. Definitely, community is so important, <laughs> very important. Um, so amazing answers again. Um, may either of you please tell us more about your campus's LGBTQ plus inclusive policies and how do students on campus feel about such policies? Yeah, great question. Um, I think that our students overall, it's so funny because um, I, you know, we get used to what we know and what we have, right? And so students, I remember one day we were talking about something and they're like, they were unaware that we are one of the, not only schools, but like a, a percentage wise, we're one of very few schools that have an LGBTQ center, for instance. And so I think that that is a great pride for them. I think they're excited to come upstairs, um, grab their Panda Express or whatever and come and hang out. And so I think that they love that. I think that they are also vocal when the things aren't working for them. And I love that because I'm like, I don't, for instance, I don't use the computer, like the same systems, right? I use, uh, you know, uh, like our finance systems and stuff, but I don't, I don't have the same interface with our student system. So if there's issues, let me know. And I think that they have been able to see that when they bring a concern forward, that we are doing everything we can to figure out how to make it work. And we're making it work, not just at our campus, but we're a system. So it is five physical campuses in an online location. And so for instance, the, um, putting pronouns on our class rosters is a system initiative, right? It has to have the voices of everyone to make sure that it makes sense for everyone. Um, and so we've also seen this be really successful in the way that we've changed our building standards as an institution. So while we comply, of course, with building codes across the state of Washington, um, we have to also think about what do we want in our, in our requirements. And so we were like, we need to have general inclusive bathrooms and all major renovations and new construction. And so we did it, right? The, folk, the, the facilities folks were there at the table and talking through what does that look like and how is that gonna work? And we're saying that even if, um, I won't get into building code because it's a little bit wrong, but um, 
we are doing what we're saying we're doing, right? We're engaging in the processes. We're finding out what's not working. We're engaging the processes as a community. Um, and not just like queer folks are talking to each other, right? It's we're bringing queer voices and we're bringing the expertise of facilities, right? The medical folks, all that together to thoughtfully figure out what makes sense for us as a community. Because I think we talk a lot about best practices, but I think that best practices have to sit in a time and a place, right? Because it doesn't always work perfectly based on some of the other things that maybe are at play. So all that to say, I think that, you know, we've really moved forward with gender inclusive bathrooms, chosen names, um, hopefully pronouns on roster soon. Um, we are doing gender affirming healthcare in our medical clinic, you know, all those types of things are really moving forward. And we're just also asking ourselves, what is next? And um, I don't know, those are the fun things to just kind of dream about, so. I think I can add, um, so in this two years, especially in the last year that I was working at USARC, um, we've been um, facilitating allied trainings and um, mm -hmm. this is really important to, to share the culture of inclusiveness and, um, I was I share um, the the ally training for the WSU employees, and I do a, a one hour uh, student ally training specifically for students. And um, that was just really good, great to see the feedback that the students are and the student and the WSU employees are giving to us for to become uh, to become allies and um, to make LGBTQ plus uh, community even more um, accepted here at WSU. Answers. Um, so in either of your opinions, why does your campus feel the need to provide spaces and resources for LGBTQ plus students? Yeah, that's a great question. This is something that we've really grappled with of like, what makes sense? What makes sense? Because when we have like LGBTQ centers or certain centers around one identity, who is being left out of those spaces? And that's something that I think we'll continue to grapple with. And I think right now it's a both and. Like we both need to create spaces for uh, where we're just only talking about LGBTQ-ness, right? And identities and issues and um, needs. And then other times we need to be creating spaces that are talking about marginalization writ large, right? Because we don't want to, I don't want to see people as one dimensional because they're not. But I think right now in this moment, we really, especially after the last four-ish, five years, four or five years, we need those spaces just for folks to feel like they are at home, like they can come in and just be, you know, take a breath and just be together, right? I, you know, I took over this role and I started this role in June of 2017. And I had worked in the center and some other spaces and ways um, over my time here at WSU. And it was such an important time for a community Right? People, if they're experiencing something outside of that, of our four walls, they can come in and they're like, I know that my people will be there and they're going to, you know, give me a, a helpful ear or they're going to give me great advice or whatever I'm looking for, I can find. And I don't know, life is hard. We all, my husband and I often joke that life is a four letter word and our students need our spaces to grow and develop in the ways that they want to and find agency and who they want to be as queer folks or allies, because we have a lot of allies in our center too. And yeah, I don't know, those are kind of my initial thoughts. I, I just, I think the spaces are so, so important because I see, like I can see how our students change, having been in there for many years now, right? Uh, not really a little last year, but like before that, I could see first year students coming in shy and nervous, like nervous to come into our space because they'd walk past our door, you know, back and forth, kind of like ruminating whether I'm going to go in or not go in, right? And then you see them just growing into these leaders and folks who are so prominent in our community that are connecting the new folks who they were just like a year or two or three before. So that's all I'll say. Yeah. Um, so before the pandemic, I was was just uh, my 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 computer. I'm um, usually is in the middle of the center, and um, I was just could see the relief that I feel some students coming and they just feel safe, right? It's exactly how Matt, Matthew said, and it's just um, for me as well, right? As a queer student, but also working for GSORC, 
And then after the, the pandemic, I mean, I saw that we saw the students, we are, we follow them in Discord, right? And this is also a space um, that students feel, they, they found a ways to, to keep, to keep in touch with, your, with each other. And now Matthew has created, we have created more events that are presential, that are presential but um, in looking forward for the, the fall, I don't know the details, but I'm sure we're going to have more and more um, safe presidential events. Amazing, amazing answers. The idea of just like students who are shy, just like growing into themselves was amazing. And like just having like a solidified space on campus is just amazing. That was really good. Yeah, can I add one thing? I think it's so important for our students. We we serve predominantly, you know, the 18 to 24 year old range. And I think it's so important for young queer folks to see older queer folks, right? It's so funny. Sometimes they're like, wow, Matthew, I could never imagine you not being like gregarious or whatever, right? And I'm like, I was really timid in some ways because I wasn't, I didn't have the self-confidence that I have now, right? And I didn't have this understanding. And so I think it's so important for those intergenerational relationships of like friendships, right? Not necessarily um, romantic relationships or whatever, but I think it's so important for, for young folks to have those people that they can look up to and say like, I see myself in you in ways and because we didn't always have that, right? As a little bit older, I'm not gonna go too deep on that one, but you know, as someone who is, you know, in their early thirties, I didn't get that when I was young. And so I think it's so important to be a model and live my most authentic life because other people are looking at us to do that. Um, and that's why I think they come oftentimes, right? Cause they get that authentic, genuine feeling of camaraderie and hopefully mentorship. So. Definitely, definitely. Um, so, and wait, I think I already said that. How do LGBTQ plus students get involved on your campus? And do you have any active out LGBTQ plus student leaders across campus? Oh yeah, it's a great one. Sorry, Marco, I'm much more of an external processor and I think Marco is much more of an internal processor. So um, I'll continue to go first. Uh, so we do, we do have some student orgs. So folks can usually come to our office and check in and like, just be like, how can I get involved with, you know, LGBTQ groups? Um, which we have a few of, our Gender and Sexuality Alliance, Queer Intersections Association, and our Graduate Pride Alliance at Washington State, GPAWS that Marco was mentioning earlier. And so uh, students come in and they ask how they can get involved. And so then uh, we connect them into those groups. Additionally, we've had lots of out leaders um, in our student governments, um, all sorts of places. And so, um, yeah, we've not necessarily had a lot of issues, right? Like. Um, there's a lot of queer leadership across um, in all sorts of different organizations. Um, there's even a more recent um, kind of pride chapter within athletics that is really starting to gain some great traction. Um, and so I think it's also helpful that we are in the state of Washington, which is a little different. Um, but yeah, I think that we're seeing that. And I think the other thing is um, we also try to connect people in early through our QHORP program. So that when they're there, they see like, okay, this is how I can get connected in, or at least try out if I want to be more of an activist, right? As I find my own identity, you know, leaving home maybe for the first time. So, Marco? Yeah, my my experience, I mean, I remember uh, in 2019, uh, before the pandemic, we promoted um, a fashion and drag show, and we made a partnership with several uh, leaderships at WSU, including the Graduating Professional Student Association which I am the president now. And um, and it was just this, I think it's important to mention that too, right, Matthew, that um, those leaderships that GearSoc ha has this um, cap capacity to bring together, right? Because it's just how we are in GearSoc. It's just this, I don't know, love for community. Amazing answers. I love that. <laughs> Um, so how is your campus supporting LGBTQ plus students across their diverse intersections of identity? Yeah. That's a great question. So um, one of my favorite initiatives um, that we have created is between our office and our Undocumented Initiatives office. And so we've ha hosted, it's called UndocuQueer Conference. Uh, we've done it four times. Um, and we've held it both in Pullman at our Pullman campus. We have another campus in Tri-Cities. 
um, about two hours away. And then we've also held it at the University of Washington, Seattle. And so it has been wonderful because it's helping, right? We intersectionally, right? We're obscuring lived experiences, how policies fail people um, and our communities. Uh, and so we're really getting into that. Like, what does it mean to be an undocumented queer person? Like something I wouldn't have thought about, right? As a citizen of the US. And, um, and so we're really helping our um, queer students understand some of that. We're helping our undocumented students understand some of that. And there's still quite a bit of overlap too, right? So I think that's been a great initiative. I think otherwise we're just really in communication of who's the most vulnerable when we're making policy decisions. We're very big on Dean Spade and like thinking about who does this impact? Who are we trying to help? Who are we maybe unintentionally harming? Uh, I think the final thing is that there's a lot of um, necessary conversation around white supremacy that's needed in the queer community. And so um, we've been doing some dialogues on that. We, uh, like in October, so LGBTQ History Month, we were like, we will do some general history stuff, but we also need to disrupt and try to dismantle white supremacy. And so we hosted a big dialogue on that and it was widely successful for being on Zoom for four hours, like 50 people that stayed the entire time. And so uh, I think those are some of the small ways. I think it's also about, um, I recognize who the staff are and the identities that we hold in our center. And so it is always on my mind, like, who are we bringing in to be speakers? Like, and are we paying them fair amounts? Like that, like we, I fully, Marco can attest to, I don't negotiate well because I'm like, that's not enough money, like for what you're doing. Um, we need to pay people for their labor. And so that's a big component of, I think our mission toward justice for all, right? And looking at those intersectionalities because who often I think is impacted, right? Like we have queer folks of color that do a lot of our, you know, speaking engagements, but like, I'm not gonna pay them less because their name isn't as big or, you know, or they're just getting started. And I'm like, no, no, we budgeted this. So like, this is what you deserve. Like it's a lot of work to do that kind of thing. So, um, so there's some of the things that were, that are on my mind. You can definitely bring a great example. We had, we had just recently in the beginning of this month, uh, we invited the poet Cesar de Leon, is identified as a queer and Chicano. And uh, it was a poetry night. We had another poet from WSU, Veronica Sandoval, Lady Mariposa presenting. And I'm also, my scholarship as a PhD candidate in cultural studies is poetry and totally connected with my own intersectionality as a Brazilian queer and um, international student. So it was such a beautiful night with everybody sharing the poetry and um, I'm just, I just get emotion to remember that, you know, because it was the last event that I promoted for GSORC. This is my last semester work for GSORC. And um, it's just so much love going on. <laughs> well, that is amazing. That is so beautiful. Um, so social justice, equality, and equity are constant journeys of progress. So what's on the agenda for your campus to improve within the next two to three years? It's hmm. a great question. I think one of the big things that we would like to see is um, post-exposure prophylaxis being offered in our pharmacy. We were working on that with our Department of Health. Our Department of Health, our Washington State Department of Health offers a, I'm blanking on the name of it. It's like a reduction in cost program, right? And so they help um, cover, right, prep, uh, and that's because it's so expensive. So all that to say, is that we're really looking at the health department post pandemic to see if they want to re look at that drug assistance program um, for PEP because we know that we need it. We have this great conversation and engaging with the Department of Health. Like, why do you need PEP if you've got PrEP? And I was like, let's talk about all the things that happen on a college campus, you know, that kind of thing. So that's one big hope that I have. Um, I think some of the other things that I would like to see is us continue to engage in the conversation and not saying like, wow, we did this once, great, right? I don't want us to, I don't want it to be checkbox diversity and equity. I want us to say like, okay, we made this decision on a policy three years ago. What's, like, let's come back to that and talk about it again. And who is it impacting? Is it, has it you know, lived its experience out? Um, or should we be thinking about this? Um, or should it just be, let's keep it. But I want to say that we have a conversation and the right folks were having that. 
because I think it's been real easy in the last couple of years to say, oh, we did it, check plus, like next problem or next thing. And I think we've got to figure out what is sustainable and what is making sense in our communities. Um, but I think continuously conversations will be about bathrooms and how do we include or you know convert more single gender bathrooms to more gender inclusive. I think that's been a big conversation topic for me because the majority or like some of our top five or 10 buildings that we have students in the most, right? They have the most classrooms or the most classes in don't necessarily have gender inclusive bathrooms. And so what is, what can we do about that? Um, we've, you know, we've created a structural change of saying our building standards will be different, but that doesn't change the here and now. So we're, I think we're still going to rumble through that, the Brene Brown fan. And so I think we'll figure some of that out. Um, I think the other things are, I don't want to have a set agenda. I want to hear from our students, right? And there's going to be things that I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that in the same way. Um, but I think our students will call to us to be more intersectional and more thoughtful of those things. And I think a lot of our work needs to not just be around LGBTQ policies, it's about you know the this, this systems right of justice and equity, in particular around dismantling white supremacy culture. And I think I'm starting to have some of those conversations. And I'm, I think, pretty blessed that most of my colleagues, if not all of them, are really willing to engage in those. So, Marco, sorry. I would like to add now that I am the new president of the GPSA, the Graduate Professional Student Association, I know that from the administration of that, from WSU, that also have an increase in assessing, supporting, and mental health for, among the students. I think this is really important. And I know that and we're going to have a big and more and more support in that regard coming. That's going to be announced very soon. And um, so I'm transitioning from graduate assistant at GSR to be the president of uh, the GPSA and the Graduate Professor Student Association. And um, so I know some information already. <laughs> and I and I can share that. <laughs> Marvelous answers. Um, what is the queerest or most LGBTQ plus aspect or thing about your campus? It's gotta be the center. Like, I know that's by like, like kind of, oh, of course, Matthew. But the reason is, is that I have had like this mentality of, so when I started, I was like, this room doesn't feel queer enough. And so um, every year I have added more rainbows to something. So like we've got these like cool little windows like above, um, like the big windows in our space. So we had those covered very similar to this background, um, the Philadelphia pride flag stuff. And then we have some other windows around our main entrance. And I had those covered with these like cool rolling hills type rainbows. Um, and then like we have all these big cabinets in the back and we have an incredible graphic design team within our division of student affairs. And they basically did this like night sky scape of in like a rainbow, but with our buildings, like monuments or like uh, important buildings on campus um, as like the foreground. So that just looks cool. So I think if you go in there, you're like, yes, if I were to drop this room in any place, I would say LGBTQ Center. Um, so okay, well, you have to add the fashion, fashion boutique that we have, oh, yeah. there, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So we have this, uh, this project that started two years ago and um, it started for to support students who are transitioning gender and then it became a huge success for the whole community and we got a lot of um, brands who are um, identified as non-binary sending donations to us and for me personally I have to share this um, I always wanted to wear a dress and um, I started you know I got two dresses and I started wearing with my friends and that was really important for me for my gender expression. So I have this is just you know one of those things that the center provides. I love that. I know I love that too. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, in three words, how would you describe your campus, either of you, to a prospective LGBTQ plus student? Oh, for my perspective as a student, it was definitely, I felt included and um, respected and uh, empowered. And absolutely, it was, it was, it's a great community for, um, 
for students in general and for LGBTQ plus, I vouch for that because yes, I am one of them. And uh, yeah, and I had questions and I I was definitely well, well welcome here. Yeah, I think affirming, welcoming, and a compound word, coog spirit. Like there's just a lot, like people are very proud to be coogs and coogs tend to look out for coogs. And so um, we try to do our best, so. Amazing answers. Um, please share for those watching on your website to learn more about LGBTQ plus life on your campus. Again, thank you both so much for speaking with me today. Um, campus Pride really does appreciate your hard works and your continued efforts to create an inclusive space for LGBTQ plus students at Washington State. Um, thank you both so much. Again, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you. We enjoyed it. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you for watching the Campus Pride Spotlight series. If you wish to learn more about this campus or any other college or university, you can search for free at the Campus Pride Index online at campusprideindex.org. That's campusprideindex.org for over 400 plus colleges and universities that have come out as LGBTQ plus friendly. Again, my name is Isla and thank you so much for watching.